Chapter 7 of The Loss of the SS Titanic by Lawrence Beasley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter 7 The Carpathia's Return to New York. The journey of the Carpathia from the time she caught the CQD from the Titanic at about 12.30 a.m. on Monday morning and turned swiftly about to her rescue until she arrived at New York on the following Thursday at 8.30 p.m. was one that demanded of the captain, officers, and crew of the vessel the most exact knowledge of navigation, the utmost vigilance in every department, both before and after the rescue, and a capacity for organization that must sometimes have been taxed to the breaking point. The extent to which all these qualities were found present, and the manner in which they were exercised, stands to be the everlasting credit of the Cunard Line and those of its servants who were in charge of the Carpathia. Captain Rostron's part in all this is a great one, and wrapped up, though his action is, in a modesty that is conspicuous in its nobility, it stands out even in his own account as a piece of work well and courageously done. As soon as the Titanic called for help and gave her position, the Carpathia was turned and headed north. All hands were called on duty. A new watch of stokers was put on, and the highest speed of which she was capable was demanded of the engineers, with the result that the distance of 58 miles between the two ships was covered in three and a half hours a speed well beyond her normal capacity. The three doctors on board each took charge of a saloon, in readiness to render help to any who needed their services. The stewards and catering staff were hard at work, preparing hot drinks and meals, and the purser's staff, ready with blankets and berths for the shipwrecked passengers as soon as they got on board. On deck, the sailors got ready lifeboats, swung them out on the davits, and stood by, prepared to lower away their crews if necessary. Fixed rope ladders, cradle chairs, nooses, and bags for the children at the hatches, to haul the rescued up to the side. On the bridge was the captain with his officers, peering into the darkness eagerly to catch the first signs of the crippled Titanic, hoping, in spite of her last despairing message of sinking by the head, to find her still afloat when her position was reached. A double watch of lookout men was set, for there were other things as well as the Titanic to look for that night, and soon they found them. As Captain Rostron said in his evidence, they saw icebergs on either side of them between 2.45 and 4 a.m., passing 20 large ones, 100 to 200 feet high, and many smaller ones and frequently had to maneuver the ship to avoid them. It was a time when every faculty was called upon for the highest use of which it was capable. With the knowledge before them that the enormous Titanic, the supposedly unsinkable ship, had struck ice and was sinking rapidly. With the lookout constantly calling to the bridge, as he must have done, icebergs on the starboard, icebergs on the port, it required courage and judgment beyond the ordinary to drive the ship ahead through that lane of icebergs and maneuver around them. As he himself said, he took the risk of full speed in his desire to save life, and probably some people might blame him for taking such a risk. But the Senate committee assured him that they, at any rate, would not, and we of the lifeboats have certainly no desire to do so. The ship was finally stopped at 4 a.m., with an iceberg reported dead ahead, the same, no doubt, we had to row around in boat 13 as we approached the Carpathia, and about the same time the first lifeboat was sighted. Again, she had to be maneuvered round the iceberg to pick up the boat, which was the one in charge of Mr. Boxhall. From him, the captain learned that the Titanic had gone down, and that he was too late to save any one but those in lifeboats, which he could now see drawing up from every part of the horizon. Meanwhile, the passengers of the Carpathia, some of them aroused by the unusual vibration of the screw, some by sailors tramping overhead as they swung away the lifeboats and got ropes and lowering tackle ready, were beginning to come on deck just as day broke, 
and here an extraordinary sight met their eyes. As far as the eye could reach to the north and west lay an unbroken stretch of field ice, with icebergs still attached to the floe and rearing aloft their mass as a hill might suddenly rise from a level plain. Ahead and to the south and east, huge floating monsters were showing up through the waning darkness, their number added to, moment by moment, as the dawn broke and flushed the horizon pink. It is remarkable how busy all those icebergs made the sea look. To have gone to bed with nothing but sea and sky, and to come on deck to find so many objects in sight, made quite a change in the character of the sea. It looked quite crowded, and a lifeboat alongside, and people clambering aboard, mostly women, in nightdresses and dressing gowns, in cloaks and shawls, in anything but ordinary clothes. Out ahead, and on all sides, little torches glittered faintly for a few moments, and then guttered out, and shouts and cheers floated across the quiet sea. It would be difficult to imagine a more unexpected sight than this that lay before the Carpathia's passengers as they lined the sides that morning in the early dawn. No novelist would dare to picture such an array of beautiful climatic conditions. The rosy dawn, the morning star, the moon on the horizon, the sea stretching in level beauty to the skyline. And on this sea, to place an ice field like the Arctic regions, and icebergs in numbers everywhere, white and turning pink and deadly cold. And near them, rowing round the icebergs to avoid them, little boats coming suddenly out of mid-ocean with passengers rescued from the most wonderful ship the world has known. No artist would have conceived such a picture. It would have seemed so highly dramatic as to border on the impossible, and would not have been attempted. Such a combination of events would pass the limit permitted by the imagination of both author and artist. The passengers crowded the rails and looked down at us as we rode up in the early morning, stood quietly aside while the crew at the gangways below took us aboard and watched us as if the ship had been in dock and we had rowed up to join her in a somewhat unusual way. Some of them have related that we were very quiet as we came aboard. It is quite true, we were, but so were they. There was very little excitement on either side, just the quiet demeanor of people who are in the presence of something too big as yet to lie within their mental grasp and which they cannot yet discuss. And so they asked us politely to have hot coffee, which we did, and food, which we generally declined. We were not hungry, and they said very little at first about the lost Titanic and our adventures in the night. Much that is exaggerated and false has been written about the mental condition of passengers as they came aboard. We have been described as being too dazed to understand what was happening, as being too overwhelmed to speak, and as looking before us with set staring gaze, dazed with the shadow of the dread event. That is, no doubt, what most people would expect in the circumstances, but I know it does not give a faithful record of how we did arrive. In fact, it is simply not true. As remarked before, the one thing that matters in describing an event of this kind is the exact truth, as near as the fallible human mind can state it. And my own impression of our mental condition is that of supreme gratitude and relief at treading the firm decks of a ship again. I am aware that experiences differed considerably according to the boats occupied, that those who were uncertain of the fate of their relatives and friends had much to make them anxious and troubled, and that it is not possible to look into another person's consciousness and say what is written there, but dealing with mental conditions as far as they are delineated by facial and bodily expressions, I think joy, relief, gratitude were the dominant emotions written on the faces of those who climbed the rope ladders and were hauled up in cradles. It must not be forgotten that no one in any boat knew who were saved in other boats. Few knew even how many boats there were and how many passengers could be saved. It was at the time probable 
that friends would follow them to the Carpathia, or be found on other steamers, or even on the pier at which we landed. The hysterical scenes that have been described are imaginative. True, one woman did fill the saloon with hysterical cries immediately after coming aboard, but she could not have known for a certainty that any of her friends were lost. Probably the sense of relief after some hours of journeying about the sea was too much for her for a time. One of the first things we did was to crowd round a steward with a bundle of telegraph forms. He was the bearer of the welcome news that passengers might send marconograms to their relatives free of charge, and soon he bore away the first sheaf of hastily scribbled messages to the operator. By the time the last boatload was aboard, the pile must have risen high in the Marconi cabin. We learned afterwards that many of these never reached their destination, and this is not a matter for surprise. There was only one operator, Cotton, on board, and although he was assisted to some extent later, when Bride from the Titanic had recovered from his injuries sufficiently enough to work the apparatus, he had so much to do that he fell asleep over this work on Tuesday night, after three days' continuous duty without rest. But we did not know the messages were held back, and imagined our friends were aware of our safety. Then, too, a roll call of the rescued was held in the Carpathia's saloon on Monday, and this was Marconi to the land in advance of all messages. It seemed certain, then, that friends at home would have all anxiety removed, but there were mistakes in the official list first telegraphed. The experience of my own friends illustrates this. The Marconogram I wrote never got through to England, nor was my name ever mentioned in any list of the saved. Even a week after landing in New York, I saw it in a black-edged final list of the missing, and it seemed certain that I had never reached the Carpathia, so much so that, as I write, there are before me obituary notices from the English papers giving a short sketch of my life in England. After landing in New York, and realizing from the lists of the saved, which a reporter showed me, that my friends had no news since the Titanic sank on Monday morning, until that night, Thursday, 9 p.m., I cabled to England at once, as I had but two shillings rescued from the Titanic. The White Star Line paid for the cables. But the messages were not delivered until 8.20 a.m. the next morning. At 9 a.m., my friends read in the papers a short account of the disaster which I had supplied to the press, so that they knew of my safety and experiences in the wreck almost at the same time. I am grateful to remember that many of my friends in London refused to count me among the missing during the three days when I was so reported. There is another side to this record of how the news came through, and a sad one indeed. Again, I wish it were not necessary to tell such things, but since they all bear on the equipment of the transatlantic lines, powerful Marconi apparatus, relays of operators, etc., it is best that they should be told. The name of an African gentleman, the same who sat near me in the library on Sunday afternoon, and whom I identified later from a photograph, was consistently reported in the lists as saved and aboard the Carpathia. His son journeyed to New York to meet him, rejoicing at his deliverance, and never found him there. When I met his family some days later, and was able to give them some details of his life aboard ship, it seemed almost cruel to tell them of the opposite experience that had befallen my friends at home. Returning to the journey of the Carpathia, the last boatload of passengers was taken aboard at 8.30 a.m., the lifeboats were hauled on deck while the collapsibles were abandoned, and the Carpathia proceeded to steam round the scene of the wreck in the hope of picking up anyone floating on wreckage. Before doing so, the captain arranged in the saloon a service over the spot where the Titanic sank, as nearly as could be calculated. A service, as he said, of respect to those who were lost and of gratitude for those who were saved. She cruised round and round the scene, but found nothing to indicate there was any hope of picking up more passengers, and as the Californian had now arrived, followed shortly afterwards by the Burma, a Russian tramp steamer, 
Captain Rostron decided to leave any further search to them and to make all speed with the rescued to land. As we moved round, there was surprisingly little wreckage to be seen. Wooden deck chairs and small pieces of other wood, but nothing of any size. But covering the sea in huge patches was a mass of reddish-yellow seaweed, as we called it for want of a name. It was said to be cork, but I never heard definitely its correct description. The problem of where to land us had next to be decided. The Carpathia was bound for Gibraltar, and the captain might continue his journey there, landing us at the Azores on the way, but he would require more linen and provisions. The passengers were mostly women and children, ill-clad, disheveled, and in need of many attentions he could not give them. Then, too, he would soon be out of the range of wireless communication with the weak apparatus his ship had, and he soon decided against that course. Halifax was the nearest in point of distance, but this meant steaming north through the ice, and he thought his passengers did not want to see more ice. He headed back, therefore, to New York, which he had left the previous Thursday, working all afternoon along the edge of the ice field which stretched away north as far as the unaided eye could reach. I have wondered since if we could possibly have landed our passengers on this ice floe from the lifeboats and gone back to pick up those swimming had we known it was there. I should think it quite feasible to have done so. It was certainly an extraordinary sight to stand on deck and see the sea covered with solid ice white and dazzling in the sun, and dotted here and there with icebergs. We ran close up, only two or three hundred yards away, and steamed parallel to the floe, until it ended towards night, and we saw to our infinite satisfaction the last of the icebergs, and the field fading away astern. Many of the rescued have no wish ever to see an iceberg again. We learned afterwards the field was nearly seventy miles long and twelve miles wide, and had lain between us and the Burma on her way to rescue. Mr. Boxhall testified that he had crossed the Grand Banks many times, but had never seen field ice before. The testimony of the captains and officers of other steamers in the neighborhood is of the same kind. They had never seen so many icebergs this time of year, or never seen such dangerous ice floes and threatening bergs. Undoubtedly, the Titanic was faced that night with unusual and unexpected conditions of ice. The captain knew not the extent of these conditions, but he knew somewhat of their existence. Alas, that he heeded not their warning. During the day, the bodies of eight of the crew were committed to the deep. Four of them had been taken out of the boats dead, and four died during the day. The engines were stopped, and all passengers on deck bared their heads while a short service was read. When it was over, the ship steamed on again to carry the living back to land. The passengers on the Carpathia were by now hard at work finding clothing for the survivors. The barber shop was raided for ties, collars, hairpins, combs, etc., of which it happened there was a large stock in hand. One good Samaritan went round the ship with a box of toothbrushes, offering them indiscriminately to all. In some cases, clothing could not be found for the ladies, and they spent the rest of the time on board in their dressing gowns and cloaks, in which they came away from the Titanic. They even slept in them, for, in the absence of berths, women had to sleep on the floor of the saloons, and in the library each night, on straw palliasses, and here it was not possible to undress properly. The men were given the smoking room floor and a supply of blankets, but the room was small, and some elected to sleep out on deck. I found a pile of towels on the bathroom floor ready for the next morning's baths, and made up a very comfortable bed on these. Later, I was waked in the middle of the night by a man offering me a berth in his four-berth cabin. Another occupant was unable to leave his berth for physical reasons, and so the cabin could not be given up to ladies. On Tuesday, the survivors met in the saloon and formed a committee among themselves 
to collect subscriptions for a general fund out of which it was resolved by vote to provide as far as possible for the destitute among the steerage passengers to present a loving cup to captain rostron and medals to the officers and crew of the carpathia and to divide any surplus among the crew of the titanic the work of this committee is not yet june first at an end but all the resolutions except the last one have been acted upon and that is now receiving the attention of the committee the presentations to the captain and crew were made the day the carpathia returned to new york from her mediterranean trip and it is a pleasure to all the survivors to know that the united states senate has recognized the service rendered to humanity by the carpathia and has voted captain rostron a gold medal commemorative of the rescue on the afternoon of tuesday i visited the steerage in company with a fellow passenger to take down the names of all who were saved we grouped them into nationalities english irish and swedish mostly and learned from them their names and homes the amount of money they possessed and whether they had friends in america the irish girls almost universally had no money rescued from the wreck and were going to friends in new york or places near while the swedish passengers among whom were a considerable number of men had saved the greater part of their money and in addition had railway tickets through to their destinations inland the saving of their money marked a curious racial difference for which i can offer no explanation no doubt the irish girls never had very much but they must have had the necessary amount fixed by the immigration laws there were some pitiful cases of women with children and the husband lost some with one or two children saved and the others lost in one case a whole family was missing and only a friend left to tell of them among the irish group was one girl of really remarkable beauty black hair and deep violet eyes with long lashes and perfectly shaped features and quite young not more than eighteen or twenty i think she lost no relatives on the titanic the following letter to the london times is reproduced here to show something of what our feeling was on board the carpathia towards the loss of the titanic it was written soon after we had the definite information on the wednesday that ice warnings had been sent to the titanic and when we all felt that something must be done to awaken public opinion to safeguard ocean travel in the future we were not aware of course how much the outside world knew and it seemed well to do something to inform the english public of what had happened at as early an opportunity as possible i have not had occasion to change any of the opinions expressed in this letter sir as one of few surviving englishmen from the steamship titanic which sank in mid-atlantic on monday morning last i am asking you to lay before your readers a few facts concerning the disaster in the hope that something may be done in the near future to ensure the safety of that portion of the traveling public who uses the atlantic highway for business or pleasure i wish to dissociate myself entirely from any report that would seek to fix the responsibility on any person or persons or body of people and by simply calling attention to matters of fact the authenticity of which is i think beyond question and can be established in any court of inquiry to allow your readers to draw their own conclusions as to the responsibility for the collision first that it was known to those in charge of the titanic that we were in the iceberg region that the atmospheric and temperature conditions suggested the near presence of icebergs that a wireless message was received from a ship ahead of us warning us that they had been seen in the locality of which latitude and longitude were given second that at the time of the collision the titanic was running at a high rate of speed third that the accommodation for saving passengers and crew was totally inadequate being sufficient only for a total of about nine hundred fifty this gave with the highest possible complement of thirty four hundred a less than one in three chance of being saved in the case of accident fourth that the number landed in the carpathia approximately seven hundred 
is a high percentage of the possible 950, and bears excellent testimony to the courage, resource, and devotion to duty of the officers and crew of the vessel. Many instances of their nobility and personal self-sacrifice are within our possession, and we know that they did all they could do with the means at their disposal. Fifth, that the practice of running mail and passenger vessels through fog and iceberg regions at a high speed is a common one. They are timed to run almost as an express train is run, and they cannot, therefore, slow down more than a few knots in time of possible danger. I have neither knowledge nor experience to say what remedies I consider should be applied, but perhaps the following suggestions may serve as a help. First, that no vessel should be allowed to leave a British port without sufficient boat and other accommodation to allow each passenger and member of the crew a seat, and that at the time of booking this fact should be pointed out to a passenger, and the number of the seat in the particular boat allotted to him then. Second, that as soon as is practicable after sailing, each passenger should go through boat drill in company with the crew assigned to his boat. Third, that each passenger boat engaged in the transatlantic service should be instructed to slow down to a few knots when in the iceberg region and should be fitted with an efficient searchlight. Yours faithfully, Lawrence Beasley. It seemed well, too, while on the Carpathia, to prepare as accurate an account as possible of the disaster, and to have this ready for the press, in order to calm public opinion, and to forestall the incorrect and hysterical accounts which some American reporters are in the habit of preparing on occasions of this kind. The first impression is often the most permanent, and in a disaster of this magnitude, where exact and accurate information is so necessary, preparation of a report was essential. It was written in odd corners of the deck and saloon of the Carpathia, and fell, it seemed very happily, into the hands of the one reporter who could best deal with it, the Associated Press. I understand it was the first report that came through and had a good deal of the effect intended. The Carpathia returned to New York in almost every kind of climatic conditions, icebergs, ice fields, and bitter cold to commence with, brilliant warm sun, thunder and lightning in the middle of one night, and so closely did the peal follow the flash that women in the saloon leaped up in alarm, saying rockets were being sent up again. Cold winds, most of the time, fogs every morning, and during a good part of one day, with the foghorn blowing constantly. Rain, choppy sea with the spray blowing overboard and coming in through the saloon windows. We said we had almost everything, but hot weather and stormy seas. So that, when we were told that Nantucket lightship had been sighted on Thursday morning from the bridge, a great sigh of relief went round to think New York and land would be reached before next morning. There is no doubt that a good many felt the waiting period of those four days very trying. The ship crowded far beyond its limits of comfort. The want of necessities of clothing and toilet, and above all, the anticipation of meeting with relatives on the pier, with, in many cases, the knowledge that other friends were left behind and would not return home again. A few looked forward to meeting on the pier their friends, to whom they had said, our revoir on the Titanic's deck, brought there by a faster boat, they said, or at any rate, to hear that they were following behind us in another boat. A very few, indeed, for the thought of the icy water and the many hours' immersion seemed to weigh against such a possibility, but we encouraged them to hope the Californian and the Burma had picked some up. Stranger things have happened, and we had all been through strange experiences. But in the midst of this rather tense feeling, one fact stands out as remarkable. No one was ill. Captain Rostron testified that on Tuesday, the doctor reported a clean bill of health, except for frostbites and shaken nerves. There were none of the illnesses supposed to follow from exposure for hours in the cold night, 
and it must be remembered a considerable number swam about for some time when the titanic sank and then either sat for hours in their wet things or lay flat on an upturned boat with the sea water washing partly over them until they were taken off in a lifeboat no scenes of women weeping and brooding over their losses hour by hour until they were driven mad with grief yet all this has been reported to the press by people on board the carpathia these women met their sorrow with the sublimest courage came on deck and talked with their fellow men and women face to face and in the midst of their loss did not forget to rejoice with those who had joined their friends on the carpathia's deck or come with them in a boat there was no need for those ashore to call the carpathia a death ship or to send coroners and coffins to the pier to meet her. Her passengers were generally in good health, and they did not pretend they were not. Presently, land came in sight, and very good it was to see it again. It was eight days since we left Southampton, but the time seemed to have stretched out to the crack of doom, and to have become eight weeks instead. So many dramatic incidents had been crowded into the last few days that the first four peaceful, uneventful days, marked by nothing that seared the memory, had faded almost out of recollection. It needed an effort to return to Southampton, Cherbourg, and Queenstown, as though returning to some event of last year. I think we all realized that time may be measured more by events than by seconds and minutes what the astronomer would call 2.20 a.m., April 15th, 1912, the survivors called the sinking of the Titanic. The hours that followed were designated being adrift in an open sea, and 4.30 a.m. was being rescued by the Carpathia. The clock was a mental one, and the hours, minutes, and seconds marked deeply on its face were emotions, strong and silent surrounded by tugs of every kind from which as well as from every available building near the river magnesium bombs were shot off by photographers while reporters shouted for news of the disaster and photographs of the passengers the carpathia drew slowly to her station at the cunard pier the gangways were pushed across and we set foot at last on american soil very thankful grateful people the mental and physical condition of the rescued as they came ashore has here again been greatly exaggerated one description says we were half fainting half hysterical bordering on hallucination only now beginning to realize the horror it is unfortunate such pictures should be presented to the world there were some painful scenes of meeting between relatives of those who were lost, but once again women showed their self-control and went through the ordeal in most cases with extraordinary calm. It is well to record that the same account added, A few, strangely enough, are calm and lucid. If for few, we read, a large majority, it will be much nearer to the true description of the landing on the Cunard Pier in New York. There seems to be no adequate reason why a report of such a scene should depict mainly the sorrow and grief, should seek for every detail to satisfy the horrible and the morbid in the human mind. The first questions the excited crowds of reporters asked as they crowded round were whether it was true that officers shot passengers, and then themselves, whether passengers shot each other, whether any scenes of horror had been noticed, and what they were. It would have been well to have noticed the wonderful state of health of most of the rescued, their gratitude for their deliverance, the thousand and one things that gave cause for rejoicing. In the midst of so much description of the hysterical side of the scene, place should be found for the normal, and I venture to think that the normal was the dominant feature in the landing that night. In the last chapter, I shall try to record the persistence of the normal all through the disaster. Nothing has been a greater surprise than to find people that do not act in conditions of danger and grief as they would be generally supposed to act, 
and, I must add, as they are generally described as acting. And so, with her work of rescue well done, the good ship Carpathia returned to New York. Everyone who came in her, everyone on the dock, and everyone who heard of her journey will agree with Captain Rostron when he says, I thank God that I was within wireless hailing distance, and that I got there in time to pick up the survivors of the wreck. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of The Loss of the SS Titanic This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter 8 The Lessons Taught by the Loss of the Titanic One of the most pitiful things in the relations of human beings to each other, the action and reaction of events that is called concretely human life, is that every now and then some of them should be called upon to lay down their lives from no sense of imperative, calculated duty, such as inspires the soldier or the sailor, but suddenly, without any previous knowledge or warning of danger, without any opportunity of escape, and without any desire to risk such conditions of danger of their own free will, it is a blot on our civilization that these things are necessary from time to time to arouse those responsible for the safety of human life from the lethargic selfishness which has governed them. The Titanic's 2,000-odd passengers went aboard thinking they were on an absolutely safe ship, and all the time there were many people, designers, builders, experts, government officials, who knew there were insufficient boats on board, and that the Titanic had no right to go fast in iceberg regions, who knew these things, and took no steps, and enacted no laws to prevent their happening. Not that they omitted to do these things deliberately, but were lulled into a state of selfish inaction, from which it needed such a tragedy as this to arouse them. It was a cruel necessity which demanded that a few should die to arouse many millions to a sense of their own insecurity, to the fact that for years the possibility of such a disaster has been imminent. Passengers have known none of these things, and while no good end would have been served by relating to them needless tales of danger on the high seas, one thing is certain, that, had they known them, many would not have traveled in such conditions, and thereby safeguards would have soon been forced on the builders, the companies, and the government. But there were people who knew and did not fail to call attention to the dangers. In the House of Commons, the matter has been frequently brought up privately, and an American naval officer, Captain E. K. Bowden, in an article that has since been widely reproduced, called attention to the defects of this very ship, the Titanic, taking her as an example of all other liners, and pointed out that she was not unsinkable and had not proper boat accommodation. The question, then, of responsibility for the loss of the Titanic must be considered, not from any idea that blame should be laid here or there and a scapegoat provided, that is a waste of time, but if a fixing of responsibility leads to quick and efficient remedy, then it should be done relentlessly. Our simple duty to those whom the Titanic carried down with her demands no less. Dealing first with the precautions for the safety of the ship, as apart from safety appliances, there can be no question. I suppose that the direct responsibility for the loss of the Titanic and so many lives must be laid on her captain. He was responsible for setting the course, day by day and hour by hour, for the speed she was traveling and he alone would have the power to decide whether or not speed must be slackened with icebergs ahead. No officer would have any right to interfere in the navigation, although they would no doubt be consulted. Nor would any official connected with the management of the line, Mr. Ismay, for example, be allowed to direct the captain in these matters, and there is no evidence that he ever tried to do so. The very fact that the captain of a ship has such absolute authority increases his responsibility enormously. 
even supposing the white star line and mr ismay had urged him before sailing to make a record again an assumption they cannot be held directly responsible for the collision he was in charge of the lives of every one on board and no one but he was supposed to estimate the risk of traveling at the speed he did when ice was reported ahead of him his action cannot be justified on the ground of prudent seamanship but the question of indirect responsibility raises at once many issues and i think removes from captain smith a good deal of personal responsibility for the loss of his ship some of these issues it will be well to consider in the first place disabusing our minds again of the knowledge that the titanic struck an iceberg and sank let us estimate the probabilities of such a thing happening an iceberg is small and occupies little room by comparison with the broad ocean on which it floats and the chances of another small object like a ship colliding with it and being sunk are very small the chances are as a matter of fact one in a million this is not a figure of speech that is the actual risk for total loss by collision with an iceberg as accepted by insurance companies the one in a million accident was what sunk the titanic even so had captain smith been alone in taking that risk he would have had to bear all the blame for the resulting disaster but it seems he is not alone the same risk has been taken over and over again by fast mail passenger liners in fog and in iceberg regions their captains have taken the long very long chance many times and won every time he took it as he had done many times before and lost of course the chances that night of striking an iceberg were much greater than one in a million they had been enormously increased by the extreme southerly position of icebergs and field ice and by the unusual number of the former thinking over the scene that met our eyes from the deck of the carpathia after we boarded her the great number of icebergs wherever the eye could reach the chances of not hitting one in the darkness of the night seemed small indeed the more one thinks about the carpathia coming at full speed through all those icebergs in the darkness the more inexplicable does it seem true the captain had an extra lookout watch and every sense of every man on the bridge alert to detect the least sign of danger and again he was not going so fast as the titanic and would have his ship under more control but granted all that he appears to have taken a great risk as he dodged and twisted around the awful two hundred foot monsters in the dark night does it mean that the risk is not so great as we who have seen the abnormal and not the normal side of taking risks with icebergs might suppose he had his own ship and passengers to consider and he had no right to take too great a risk but captain smith could not know icebergs were there in such numbers what warnings he had of them is not yet thoroughly established there were probably three but it is in the highest degree unlikely that he knew that any vessel had seen them in such quantities as we saw them monday morning in fact it is unthinkable he thought no doubt that he was taking an ordinary risk and it turned out to be an extraordinary one to read some criticisms it would seem as if he deliberately ran his ship in defiance of all custom through a region infested with icebergs and did a thing which no one has ever done before that he outraged all precedent by not slowing down but it is plain that he did not every captain who has run full speed through fog and iceberg regions is to blame for the disaster as much as he is they got through and he did not other liners can go faster than the titanic could possibly do had they struck ice they would have been injured even more deeply than she was for it must not be forgotten that the force of the impact varies as the square of the velocity i e it is four times as much at sixteen knots as at eight knots nine times as much at twenty four and so on and with not much margin of time left for these fast boats they must go full speed ahead nearly all the time 
Remember how they advertised to leave New York Wednesday, dine in London the following Monday. And it is done regularly, much as an express train is run to time. Their officers, too, would have been less able to avoid a collision than Murdoch of the Titanic was, for at the greater speed they would be on the iceberg in a shorter time. Many passengers can tell of crossing with fog a good deal of the way, sometimes all the way, and they have been only a few hours late at the end of the journey. So that it is, the custom that is at fault, not one particular captain. Custom is established largely by demand, and supply, too, is the answer to demand. What the public demanded the White Star Line supplied, and so both the public and the line are concerned with the question of indirect responsibility. The public has demanded more and more every year, greater speed as well as greater comfort, and by ceasing to patronize, the low speed boats has gradually forced the pace to what it is at present. Not that speed in itself is a dangerous thing, it is sometimes much safer to go quickly than slowly, but that, given the facilities for speed and the stimulus exerted by the constant public demand for it, occasions arise when the judgment of those in command of a ship becomes swayed, largely unconsciously, no doubt, in favor of taking risks which the smaller liners would never take. The demand on the skipper of a boat like the Californian, for example, which lay hove to nineteen miles away with her engines stopped, is infinitesimal compared with that on Captain Smith. An old traveler told me on the Carpathia that he has often grumbled to the officers for what he called absurd precautions in lying to and wasting his time which he regarded as very valuable. But after hearing of the Titanic's loss, he recognized that he was, to some extent, responsible for the speed at which she had traveled, and would never be so again. He had been one of the traveling public, who had constantly demanded to be taken to his journey's end in the shortest time possible, and had made a row about it if he was likely to be late. There are some businessmen to whom five or six days on board are exceedingly irksome and represent a waste of time. Even an hour saved at the journey's end is a consideration to them. And if the demand is not always a conscious one, it is there as an unconscious factor, always urging the highest speed of which the ship is capable. The man who demands fast travel unreasonably must undoubtedly take his share in the responsibility. He asks to be taken over at a speed which will land him in something over four days. He forgets, perhaps, that Columbus took 90 days in a 40-ton boat, and that only 50 years ago, paddle steamers took six weeks, and all the time the demand is greater and the strain is more. The public demand speed and luxury. The lines supply it. Until presently, the safety limit is reached. The undue risk is taken and the Titanic goes down. All of us who have cried for greater speed must take our share in the responsibility. The expression of such a desire and the discontent with so-called slow travel are the seed sown in the minds of men, to bear fruit presently in an insistence on greater speed. We may not have done so directly, but we may, perhaps, have talked about it and thought about it, and we know no action begins without thought. The White Star Line has received very rough handling from some of the press, but the greater part of this criticism seems to be unwarranted and to arise from the desire to find a scapegoat. After all, they had made better provision for the passengers the Titanic carried than any other line has done, for they had built what they believed to be a huge lifeboat, unsinkable in all ordinary conditions. Those who embarked in her were almost certainly in the safest ship, along with the Olympic, afloat. She was probably quite immune from the ordinary effects of wind, waves, and collisions at sea, and needed to fear nothing but running on a rock, or, what was worse, a floating iceberg. For the effects of collision were, so far as damage was concerned, the same as if it had been a rock, and the danger greater, for one is charted and the other is not. 
Then, too, while the theory of the unsinkable boat has been destroyed at the same time as the boat itself, we should not forget that it served a useful purpose on deck that night. It eliminated largely the possibility of panic, and those rushes for the boats which might have swamped some of them. I do not wish for a moment to suggest that such things would have happened, because the more information that comes to hand of the conduct of the people on board, the more wonderful seems the complete self-control of all, even when the last boats had gone and nothing but the rising waters met their eyes, only that the generally entertained theory rendered such things less probable. The theory, indeed, was really a safeguard, though built on false premise. There is no evidence that the White Star Line instructed the captain to push the boat or to make any records. The probabilities are that no such attempt would be made on the first trip. The general instructions to their commanders bear quite the other interpretation. It will be well to quote them in full as issued to the press during the sittings of the United States Senate Committee. Instructions to Commanders Commanders must distinctly understand that the issue of regulations does not in any way relieve them from the responsibility for the safe and efficient navigation of their respective vessels, and they are also enjoined to remember that they must run no risks which might, by any possibility, result in accident to their ships. It is to be hoped that they will ever bear in mind that the safety of the lives and property entrusted to their care is the ruling principle that should govern them in the navigation of their vessels, and that no supposed gain in expedition or saving of time on the voyage is to be purchased at the risk of accident. Commanders are reminded that the steamers are to a great extent uninsured, and that their own livelihood, as well as the company's success, depends upon immunity from accident. No precaution which ensures safe navigation is to be considered excessive. Nothing could be plainer than these instructions, and had they been obeyed, the disaster would never have happened. They warn commanders against the only thing left as a menace to their unsinkable boat, the lack of precaution which ensures safe navigation. In addition, the White Star Line had complied to the full extent with the requirements of the British government. Their ship had been subjected to an inspection so rigid that, as one officer remarked in evidence, it became a nuisance. The Board of Trade employs the best experts and knows the dangers that attend ocean travel and the precautions that should be taken by every commander. If these precautions are not taken, it will be necessary to legislate until they are. No motorist is allowed to careen at full speed along a public highway in dangerous conditions, and it should be an offense for a captain to do the same on the high seas with a ship full of unsuspecting passengers. They have entrusted their lives to the government of their country through its regulations, and they are entitled to the same protection in Mid-Atlantic as they are in Oxford Street or Broadway. The open sea should no longer be regarded as a neutral zone where no country's police laws are operative. Of course, there are difficulties in the way of drafting international regulations. Many governments would have to be consulted, and many difficulties that seem insuperable overcome. But that is the purpose for which governments are employed. That is why experts and ministers of governments are appointed and paid to overcome difficulties for people who appoint them, and who expect them, among other things, to protect their lives. The American government must share the same responsibility. It is useless to attempt to fix it on the British Board of Trade, for the reason that the boats were built in England and inspected there by British officials. They carried American citizens largely, and entered American ports. It would have been the simplest matter for the United States government to veto the entry of any ship which did not conform to its laws of regulating speed in conditions of fog and icebergs, had they provided such laws. The fact is that the American nation has practically no mercantile marine, and in time of a disaster such as this it forgets, perhaps, that it has exactly the same right, 
and therefore the same responsibility as the British government to inspect and to legislate, the right that is easily enforced by refusal to allow entry. The regulation of speed in dangerous regions could well be undertaken by some fleet of international police patrol vessels, with power to stop, if necessary, any boat found guilty of reckless racing. The additional duty of warning ships of the exact locality of icebergs could be performed by these boats. It would not, of course, be possible or advisable to fix a speed limit, because the region of icebergs varies in a position as the icebergs float south, varies in point of danger as they melt and disappear, and the whole question has to be left largely to the judgment of the captain on the spot but it would be possible to make it an offense against the law to go beyond a certain speed in known conditions of danger. So much for the question of regulating speed on the high seas. The secondary question of safety appliances is governed by that same principle, that, in the last analysis, it is not the captain, not the passenger, not the builders and owners, but the government's through their experts, who are to be held responsible for the provision of life-saving devices. Morally, of course, the owners and builders are responsible, but at present, moral responsibility is too weak an incentive in human affairs. That is the miserable part of the whole wretched business. To induce owners generally to make every possible provision for the lives of those in their charge, to place human safety so far above every other consideration that no plan shall be left unconsidered, no device left untested by which passengers can escape from a sinking ship. But it is not correct to say, as it has been said frequently, that it is greed and dividend hunting that have characterized the policy of the steamship companies in their failure to provide safety appliances. These things in themselves are not expensive. They have vied with each other in making their lines attractive in point of speed, size, and comfort, and they have been quite justified in doing so. Such things are the product of ordinary competition between commercial houses. Where they have all failed morally is to extend to their passengers the consideration that places their lives as of more interest to them than any other conceivable thing. They are not alone in this. Thousands of other people have done the same thing and would do it today, in factories, in workshops, in mines, did not the government intervene and insist on safety precautions. The thing is a defect in human life of today, thoughtlessness for the well-being of our fellow men, and we are all guilty of it in some degree. It is folly for the public to rise up now and condemn the steamship companies, their failing is the common failing of the immorality of indifference. The remedy is the law, and it is the only remedy at present that will really accomplish anything. The British law on the subject dates from 1894 and requires only 20 boats for a ship the size of the Titanic. The owners and builders have obeyed this law and fulfilled their legal responsibility. Increase this responsibility and they will fulfill it again and the matter is ended so far as appliances are concerned. It should perhaps be mentioned that in a period of ten years only nine passengers were lost on British ships. The law seemed to be sufficient in fact. The position of the American government, however, is worse than that of the British government. Its regulations require more than double the boat accommodation which British regulations do and yet it has allowed hundreds of thousands of its subjects to enter its ports on boats that defied its own laws. Had their government not been guilty of the same indifference, passengers would not have been allowed aboard any British ship lacking in boat accommodation. The simple expedient again of refusing entry. The reply of the British government to the Senate Committee, accusing the Board of Trade of insufficient requirements and lax inspection, might well be, Ye have a law, see to it yourselves. End of part one of chapter eight. Of chapter eight of the loss of the SS Titanic by Lawrence Beasley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recorded by Allison Hester. Chapter 8, Part 2 The Lessons Taught by the Loss of the Titanic It will be well now to consider briefly the various appliances that have been suggested to ensure the safety of passengers and crew, and in doing so, it may be remembered that the average man and woman has the same right as the expert to consider and discuss these things. They are not so technical as to prevent any one of ordinary intelligence from understanding their construction. Using the term in its widest sense, we come first to bulkheads and watertight compartments. It is impossible to attempt a discussion here of the exact constructional details of these parts of a ship. But in order to illustrate briefly what is the purpose of having bulkheads, we may take the Titanic as an example. She was divided into 16 compartments by 15 transverse steel walls called bulkheads. If a hole is made in the side of the ship in any one compartment, steel watertight doors seal off the only openings in that compartment and separate it as a damaged unit from the rest of the ship, and the vessel is brought to land in safety. Ships have even put into the nearest port for inspection after collision, and finding only one compartment full of water and no other damage, have left again for their home port without troubling to disembark passengers and effect repairs. The design of the Titanic's bulkheads calls for some attention. The Scientific American, in an excellent article on the comparative safety of the Titanic's and other types of watertight compartments, draws attention to the following weaknesses in the former, from the point of view of possible collision with an iceberg. She had no longitudinal bulkheads, which would subdivide her into smaller compartments and prevent the water filling the whole of a large compartment. Probably, too, the length of a large compartment was, in any case, too great, 53 feet. The Mauritania, on the other hand, in addition to transverse bulkheads, is fitted with longitudinal torpedo bulkheads, and the space between them and the side of the ship is utilized as a coal bunker. Then, too, in the Mauritania, all bulkheads are carried up to the top deck, whereas, in the case of the Titanic, they reached in some parts only to the saloon deck, and in others to a lower deck still. The weakness of this being that, when the water reached to the top of a bulkhead as the ship sank by the head, it flowed over and filled the next compartment. The British Admiralty, which subsidizes the Mauritania and the Lusitania as fast cruisers in time of war, insisted on this type of construction, and it is considered vastly better than that used in the Titanic. The writer of the article thinks it is possible that these ships might not have sunk as the result of a similar collision. But the ideal ship from the point of bulkhead construction he considers to have been the Great Eastern, constructed many years ago by the famous engineer Brunel. So thorough was her system of compartments divided and subdivided by many transverse and longitudinal bulkheads that when she tore a hole 80 feet long in her side by striking a rock, she reached port in safety. Unfortunately, the weight and cost of this method was so great that his plan was subsequently abandoned. But it would not be just to say that the construction of the Titanic was a serious mistake on the part of the White Star Line or her builders, on the ground that her bulkheads were not so well constructed as those of the Lusitania and Mauritania, which were built to fulfill British Admiralty regulations for time of war, an extraordinary risk which no builder of a passenger steamer, as such, would be expected to take into consideration when designing the vessel. It should be constantly borne in mind that the Titanic met extraordinary conditions on the night of the collision. She was probably the safest ship afloat in all ordinary conditions. Collision with an iceberg is not an ordinary risk, but this disaster will probably result in altering the whole construction of bulkheads and compartments to the great eastern type in order to include the one in a million risk of iceberg collision and loss. Here comes in the question of increased cost of construction, and in addition, the great loss of cargo carrying space with decreased earning capacity, 
both of which will mean an increase in the passenger rates. This the traveling public will have to face, and undoubtedly will be willing to face, for the satisfaction of knowing that what was so confidently affirmed by passengers on the Titanic's deck that night of the collision will then be really true, that we are on an unsinkable boat, so far as human forethought can devise. After all, this must be the solution to the problem how best to ensure safety at sea. Other safety appliances are useful and necessary, but not usable in certain conditions of weather. The ship itself must always be the safety appliance that is really trustworthy, and nothing must be left undone to ensure this. Wireless Apparatus and Operators The range of the apparatus might well be extended, but the principal defect is the lack of an operator for night duty on some ships. The awful fact that the Californian lay a few miles away, able to save every soul on board, and could not catch the message because the operator was asleep, seems too cruel to dwell upon. Even on the Carpathia, the operator was on the point of retiring when the message arrived, and we should have been much longer afloat, and some boats possibly swamped, had he not caught the message when he did. It has been suggested that officers should have a working knowledge of wireless telegraphy, and this is no doubt a wise provision. It would enable them to supervise the work of the operators more closely, and from all the evidence, this seems a necessity. The exchange of vitally important messages between a sinking ship and those rushing to her rescue should be under the control of an experienced officer. To take but one example, Bride testified that after giving the Burma the CQD message and the position and getting a reply, they got into touch with the Carpathia, and while talking with her, were interrupted by the Burma asking what was the matter. No doubt it was the duty of the Burma to come at once without asking any questions, but the reply from the Titanic, telling the Burma's operator not to be a fool by interrupting, seems to have been a needless waste of precious moments. To reply, we are sinking, would have taken no longer, especially when in their own estimation of the strength of the signals they thought the Burma was the nearest ship. It is well to notice that some large liners have already a staff of three operators. Submarine Signaling Apparatus there are occasions when wireless apparatus is useless as a means of saving life at sea promptly. One of its weaknesses is that when the ship's engines are stopped, messages can no longer be sent out, that is, with the system at present adopted. It will be remembered that the Titanic's messages got gradually fainter and then ceased altogether as she came to rest with her engines shut down. Again, in fogs, and most accidents occur in fogs, while wireless informs of the accident, it does not enable one ship to locate another closely enough to take off her passengers at once. There is, as yet, no method known by which wireless telegraphy will fix the direction of a message, and after a ship has been in fog for any considerable length of time, it is more difficult to give the exact position to another vessel bringing help. Nothing could illustrate these two points better than the story of how the Baltic found the Republic in the year 1909 in a dense fog off Nantucket lightship, when the latter was drifting helplessly after collision with the Florida. The Baltic received a wireless message stating the Republic's condition and the information that she was in touch with Nantucket through a submarine bell, which she could hear ringing. The Baltic turned and went towards the position in the fog, picked up the submarine bell signal from Nantucket, and then began searching near this position for the Republic. It took her twelve hours to find the damaged ship, zigzagging across a circle within which she thought the Republic might lie. In a rough sea, it is doubtful whether the Republic would have remained afloat long enough for the Baltic to find her and take off all her passengers. Now, on these two occasions, when wireless telegraphy was found to be unreliable, the usefulness of the submarine bell at once becomes apparent. 
the baltic could have gone unerringly to the republic in the dense fog had the latter been fitted with a submarine emergency bell it will perhaps be well to spend a little time describing the submarine signaling apparatus to see how this result could have been obtained twelve anxious hours in a dense fog on a ship which was injured so badly that she subsequently foundered is an experience which every appliance known to human invention should be enlisted to prevent submarine signaling has never received that public notice which wireless telegraphy has for the reason that it does not appeal so readily to the popular mind that it is an absolute necessity to every ship carrying passengers or carrying anything for that matter is beyond question it is an additional safeguard that no ship can afford to be without there are many occasions when the atmosphere fails lamentably as a medium for carrying messages when fog falls down as it does sometimes in a moment on hundreds of ships coasting down the traffic ways round our shores ways which are defined so easily in clear weather and with such difficulty in fogs the hundreds of lighthouses and lightships which serve as warning beacons and on which many millions of money have been spent are for all practical purposes as useless to the navigator as if they had never been built he is just as helpless as if he were back in the years before fifteen fourteen when trinity house was granted a charter by henry the eighth for the relief of the shipping of this realm of england and began a system of lights on the shores of which the present chain of lighthouses and lightships is the outcome nor is the foghorn much better the presence of different layers of fog and air and their varying densities which cause both reflection and refraction of sound prevent the air from being a reliable medium for carrying it now submarine signaling has none of these defects for the medium is water subject to no such variable conditions as the air its density is practically non-variable and sound travels through it at the rate of four thousand four hundred feet per second without deviation or reflection the apparatus consists of a bell designed to ring either pneumatically from a light ship electronically from the shore the bell itself being a tripod at the bottom of the sea automatically from a floating bell buoy or by hand from a ship or boat the sound travels from the bell in every direction like waves in a pond and falls it may be on the side of a ship the receiving apparatus is fixed inside the skin of the ship and consists of a small iron tank sixteen inches square and eighteen inches deep the front of the tank facing the ship's iron skin is missing and the tank being filled with water is bolted to the framework and sealed firmly to the ship's side by rubber facing in this way a portion of the ship's iron hull is washed by the sea on one side and water in the tank on the other vibrations from a bell ringing at a distance fall on the iron side travel through and strike on two microphones hanging in the tank these microphones transmit the sound along wires to the chart room where telephones convey the message to the officer on duty there are two of these tanks or receivers fitted against the ship's side one on the port and one on the starboard side near the bows and as far down below the water level as is possible the direction of sounds coming to the microphones hanging in these tanks can be estimated by switching alternately to the port and starboard tanks if the sound is of greater intensity on the port side then the bell signaling is off the port bows and similarly on the starboard side the ship is turned towards the sound until the same volume of sound is heard from both receivers when the bell is known to be dead ahead so accurate is this in practice that a trained operator can steer his ship in the densest fog directly to a light ship or any other point where a submarine bell is sending its warning beneath the sea not subject to any of the limitations and variations imposed on the atmosphere and the ether as media for the transmission of light 
blasts of a foghorn, and wireless vibrations. At present, the chief use of submarine signaling is from the shore or a light ship to ships at sea, and not from ship to ship or from ship to the shore. In other words, ships carry only receiving apparatus, and lighthouses and light ships use only signaling apparatus. Some of the lighthouses and light ships on our coasts already have these submarine bells, in addition to their lights, and in bad weather the bells send out their messages to warn ships of their proximity to a danger point. This invention enables ships to pick up the sound of bell after bell on a coast and run along it in the densest fog, almost as well as in daylight. Passenger steamers coming into port do not have to wander about in the fog, groping their way blindly into harbor. By having a coat of rings, and judging by the intensity of the sound, it is possible to tell almost exactly where a ship is in relation to the coast or to some light ship. The British Admiralty report in 1906 said, If the light ships round the coast were fitted with submarine bells, it would be possible for ships fitted with receiving apparatus to navigate in fog with almost as great certainty as in clear weather and the following remark of a captain engaged in coast service is instructive he had been asked to cut down expenses by omitting the submarine signaling apparatus but replied i would rather take out the wireless that only enables me to tell other people where i am the submarine signal enables me to find out where i am myself the range of the apparatus is not so wide as that of wireless telegraphy varying from 10 to 15 miles for a large ship, although instances of 20 to 30 are on record, and from 3 to 8 miles for a small ship. At present, the receiving apparatus is fixed on only some 650 steamers of the merchant marine, these being most frequently the first-class passenger liners. There is no question that it should be installed, along with wireless apparatus, on every ship of over 1,000 tons gross tonnage. Equally important is the provision of signaling apparatus on board ships. It is obviously just as necessary to transmit a signal as to receive one, but at present the sending of signals from ships has not been perfected. The invention of signal transmitting apparatus to be used while the ship is underway is as yet in the experimental stage. But while she is at rest, a bell, similar to those used by lighthouses, can be sunk over her side and rung by hand with exactly the same effect. But liners are not provided with them. They cost only 60 pounds. As mentioned before, with another 60 pounds spent on the Republic's equipment, the Baltic could have picked up her bell and steered direct to her, just as they both heard the bell of Nantucket Lightship. Again, if the Titanic had been provided with the bell, and the Californian with receiving apparatus, neither of them was, the officer on the bridge could have heard the signals from the telephones near. A smaller size for use in lifeboats is provided, and would be heard by receiving apparatus for approximately five miles. If we had hung one of these bells over the side of the lifeboats afloat that night, we should have been free from the anxiety of being run down as we lay across the Carpathia's path without a light. Or, if we had gone adrift in a dense fog and wandered miles apart from each other on the sea, as we inevitably should have done, the Carpathia could still have picked up each boat individually by means of the bell signal. In those ships fitted with receiving apparatus, at least one officer is obliged to understand the working of the apparatus, a very wise precaution, and, as suggested above, one that should be taken with respect to wireless apparatus also. It was a very great pleasure to me to see all this apparatus in manufacture and in use at one of the principal submarine signaling works in America, and to hear some of the remarkable stories of its value in actual practice. I was struck by the aptness of the motto adopted by them, De Profundas Clamavi, in relation to the Titanic's end and the calls of our passengers from the sea when she sank. Out of the deep have I called unto thee, 
is indeed a suitable motto for those who are doing all they can to prevent such calls arising from their fellow men and women out of the deep. Fixing of Steamship Routes The lanes along which the liners travel are fixed by agreement among the steamship companies in consultation with the hydrographic departments of the different countries. These routes are arranged so that the east-bound steamers are always a number of miles away from those going west, and thus the danger of collision between east- and west-bound vessels is entirely eliminated. The lanes can be moved farther south if icebergs threaten, and north again when the danger is removed. Of course, the farther south they are placed, the longer the journey to be made and the longer the time spent on board, with consequent grumbling by some passengers. For example, the lanes since the disaster to the Titanic have been moved 100 miles farther south, which means 180 miles longer journey, taking eight hours. The only real precaution against colliding with icebergs is to go south of the place where they are likely to be. There is no other way. Lifeboats the provision was, of course, woefully inadequate. The only humane plan is to have a numbered seat in a boat assigned to each passenger and member of the crew. It would seem well to have this number pointed out at the time of booking a berth, and to have a plan in each cabin showing where the boat is and how to get to it the most direct way, a most important consideration with a ship like the Titanic with over two miles of deck space. Boat drills of the passengers and crew of each boat should be held, under compulsion, as soon as possible after leaving port. I asked an officer as to the possibility of having such a drill immediately after the gangways are withdrawn and before the tugs are allowed to haul the ship out of dock, but he says the difficulties are almost insuperable at such a time. If so, the drill should be conducted in sections as soon as possible after sailing and should be conducted in a thorough manner. Children in school are called upon suddenly to go through fire drill, and there was no reason why passengers on board ship should not be similarly trained. So much depends on order and readiness in time of danger. Undoubtedly, the whole subject of manning, provisioning, loading, and lowering of lifeboats should be in the hands of an expert officer, who should have no other duties. The modern liner has become far too big to permit the captain to exercise control over the whole ship, and all vitally important subdivisions should be controlled by a separate authority. It seems a piece of bitter irony to remember that on the Titanic a special chef was engaged at a large salary, larger perhaps than that of any officer, and no boatmaster or some such officer was considered necessary. The general system, again, not criminal neglect, as some hasty criticisms would say, but lack of consideration for our fellow man, the placing of luxurious attractions above that kindly forethought that allows no precaution to be neglected for even the humblest passenger. But it must not be overlooked that the provision of sufficient lifeboats on deck is not evidence they will all be launched easily or all the passengers taken off safely. It must be remembered that ideal conditions prevailed that night for launching boats from the decks of the Titanic. There was no list that prevented the boats getting away. They could be launched on both sides, and when they were lowered, the sea was so calm that they pulled away without any of the smashing against the side that is possible in rough seas. Sometimes it would mean that only those boats on the side sheltered from a heavy sea could ever get away and this would at once half the boat accommodation. And when launched, there would be the danger of swamping in such a heavy sea. All things considered, lifeboats might be the poorest sort of safeguard in certain conditions. Life rafts are said to be much inferior to lifeboats in a rough sea, and collapsible boats made of canvas and thin wood soon decay under exposure to weather and are danger traps at a critical moment. Some of the lifeboats should be provided with motors, to keep the boats together and to tow if necessary. The launching is another important matter. 
the titanic's davits worked excellently and no doubt were largely responsible for all the boats getting away safely they were far superior to those on most liners pontoons after the sinking of the Burgonia, when two americans lost their lives a prize of four thousand pounds was offered by their heirs for the best life-saving device applicable to ships at sea a board sat to consider the various appliances sent in by competitors and finally awarded the prize to an englishman whose design provided for a flat structure the width of the ship which could be floated off when required and would accommodate several hundred passengers it has never been adopted by any steamship line other similar designs are known by which the whole of the after deck can be pushed over from the stern by a ratchet arrangement with air tanks below to buoy it up it seems to be a practical suggestion one point where titanic management failed lamentably was to provide a properly trained crew to each lifeboat the rowing was in most cases execrable there is no more reason why a steward should be able to row than a passenger less so than some of the passengers who were lost men of leisure accustomed to all kinds of sport including rowing and in addition probably more fit physically than a steward to row for hours on the open sea and if a steward cannot row he has no right to be at an oar so that under the unwritten rule that passengers take precedence of the crew when there is not sufficient accommodation for all a situation that should never be allowed to arise again for a member of the crew should have an equal opportunity with a passenger to save his life the majority of stewards and cooks should have stayed behind and passengers have come instead they could not have been of less use and they might have been of more it will be remembered that the proportion of crew saved to passengers was two hundred ten to four hundred ninety five a high proportion another point arises out of these figures deduct twenty one members of the crew who were stewardesses and one hundred eighty nine men of the crew are left as against the four hundred ninety five passengers of these some got on the overturned collapsible boat after the titanic sank and a few were picked up by the lifeboats but these were not many in all now with the seventeen boats brought to the carpathia and an average of six of the crew to man each boat probably a higher average than was realized we get a total of one hundred two who should have been saved as against one hundred eighty nine who actually were there were as is known stokers and stewards in the boats who were not members of the lifeboats crews it may seem heartless to analyze figures in this way and suggest that some of the crew who got to the carpathia never should have done so but after all passengers took their passage under certain rules written and unwritten and one is that in times of danger the servants of the company in whose boats they sail shall first of all see to the safety of the passengers before thinking of their own there were only 126 men passengers saved as against 189 of the crew and 661 men lost as against 686 of the crew so that actually the crew had a greater percentage saved than the men passengers 22 percent against 16 but steamship companies are faced with real difficulties in this matter the crews are never the same for two voyages together they sign on for the one trip then perhaps take a berth on shore as waiters stokers in hotel furnace rooms etc to resume life on board any other ship that is handy when the desire comes to go to sea again they can in no sense be regarded as a part of a homogeneous crew subject to regular discipline and educated to appreciate the morale of a particular liner as a man-of-war's crew is searchlights these seem an absolute necessity and the wonder is that they have not been fitted before to all ocean liners not only are they of use in lighting up the sea a long distance ahead but as flashlight signals they permit of communication with other ships as i write through the window can be seen the flashes from river steamers plying up the hudson in new york 
each with its searchlight, examining the river, lighting up the bank for hundreds of yards ahead, and bringing every object within its reach into prominence. They are regularly used, too, in the Suez Canal. I suppose there is no question that the collision would have been avoided had a searchlight been fitted to the Titanic's masthead. The climatic conditions for its use must have been ideal that night. There are other things besides icebergs. Derelicts are reported from time to time, and fishermen lie in the lanes without lights. They would not always be of practical use, however. They would be of no service in heavy rain, in fog, in snow, or in flying spray, and the effect is sometimes to dazzle the eyes of the lookout. While writing of the lookout, much has been made of the omission to provide the lookout on the Titanic with glasses. The general opinion of officers seems to be that it is better not to provide them, but to rely on good eyesight and wide-awake men. After all, in a question of actual practice, the opinion of officers should be accepted as final, even if it seems to the landsmen the better thing to provide glasses. Cruising Light Ships One or two internationally owned and controlled light ships, fitted with every known device for signaling and communication, would rob those regions of most of their terrors. They could watch and chart the icebergs, report their exact position, the amount and direction of daily drift in the changing currents that are found there. To them, too, might be entrusted the duty of police patrol. End of Part 2 of Chapter 8「9 of the loss of the SS Titanic by Lawrence Beasley this LibriVox recording is in the public domain recorded by Allison Hester chapter 9 some impressions no one can pass through an event like the wreck of the Titanic without recording mentally many impressions deep and vivid of what has been seen and felt in so far as such impressions are of benefit to mankind, they should not be allowed to pass unnoticed. And this chapter is an attempt to picture how people thought and felt from the time they first heard of the disaster to the landing in New York, when there was opportunity to judge of events somewhat from a distance. While it is to some extent a personal record, the mental impressions of other survivors have been compared and found to be in many cases closely in agreement. Naturally, it is very imperfect and pretends to be no more than a sketch of the way people act under the influence of strong emotions produced by imminent danger. In the first place, the principal fact that stands out is the almost entire absence of any expressions of fear or alarm on the part of passengers and the conformity to the normal on the part of almost everyone. I think it is no exaggeration to say that those who read of the disaster quietly at home and picture to themselves the scene as the Titanic was sinking had more of the sense of horror than those who stood on the deck and watched her go down inch by inch. The fact is that the sense of fear came to the passengers very slowly a result of the absence of any signs of danger and the peaceful night, and as it became evident gradually that there was serious damage to the ship, the fear that came with the knowledge was largely destroyed as it came. There was no sudden overwhelming sense of danger that passed through thought so quickly that it was difficult to catch up and grapple with it. No need for the warning to be not afraid of sudden fear such as might have been present had we collided head-on with a crash and a shock that flung everyone out of his bunk to the floor. Everyone had time to give each condition of danger attention as it came along, and the result of their judgment was, as if they had said, well, here is this thing to be faced, and we must see it through as quietly as we can. Quietness and self-control were undoubtedly the two qualities most expressed. There were times when danger loomed more nearly, and there was temporarily some excitement, for example, when the first rocket went up. But after the first realization of what it meant, the crowd took hold of the situation 
and soon gained the same quiet control that was evident at first as the sense of fear ebbed and flowed it was so obviously a thing within one's own power to control that quite unconsciously realizing the absolute necessity of keeping cool every one for his own safety put away the thought of danger as far as was possible then too the curious sense of the whole thing being a dream was very prominent that all were looking on at the scene from a nearby vantage point in a position of perfect safety and that those who walked the decks or tied one another's life belts on were the actors in a scene of which we were but spectators that the dream would end soon and we should wake up to find the scene had vanished many people have had a similar experience in times of danger but it was very noticeable standing on the titanic's deck I remember observing it particularly while tying on a life belt for a man on the deck. It is fortunate that it should be so. To be able to survey such a scene dispassionately is a wonderful aid in the destruction of the fear that go with it. One thing that helped considerably to establish this orderly condition of affairs was the quietness of the surroundings. It may seem weariness to refer again to this but I am convinced it had much to do with keeping everyone calm. The ship was motionless. There was not a breath of wind. The sky was clear. The sea like a mill pond. The general atmosphere was peaceful, and all on board responded unconsciously to it. But what controlled the situation principally was the quality of obedience and respect for authority, which is a dominant characteristic of the Teutonic race. Passengers did as they were told by the officers in charge. Women went to the decks below. Men remained where they were told and waited in silence for the next order, knowing instinctively that this was the only way to bring about the best result for all on board. The officers, in their turn, carried out the work assigned to them by their superior officers as quickly and orderly as circumstances permitted, the senior ones being in control of the manning, filling and lowering of the lifeboats while the junior officers were lowered in individual boats to take command of the fleet adrift on the sea similarly the engineers below the band the gymnasium instructor were all performing their tasks as they came along orderly quietly without question or stopping to consider what was their chance of safety this correlation on the part of passengers officers and crew was simply obedience to duty and it was innate rather than the product of reasoned judgment i hope it will not seem to detract in any way from the heroism of those who faced the last plunge of the titanic so courageously when all the boats had gone if it does it is the difficulty of expressing an idea in adequate words to say their quiet heroism was largely unconscious temperamental not a definite choice between two ways of acting all that was visible on deck before the boats left tended to this conclusion and the testimony of those who went down with the ship and were afterwards rescued is of the same kind certainly it seems to express much more general nobility of character in a race of people consisting of different nationalities to find heroism an unconscious quality of the race than to have it arising as an effort of will to have to bring it out consciously it is unfortunate that some sections of the press should seek to chronicle mainly the individual acts of heroism the collective behavior of a crowd is of so much more importance to the world and so much more a test if a test be wanted of how a race of people behaves the attempt to record the acts of individuals leads apparently to such false reports as that of major butt holding at bay with a revolver a crowd of passengers and shooting them down as they tried to rush the boats or of captain smith shouting be british through a megaphone and subsequently committing suicide along with first officer murdoch it is only a morbid sense of things that would describe such incidents as heroic everyone knows that major butt was a brave man but his record of heroism would not be enhanced if he 
a trained army officer, were compelled under orders from the captain to shoot down unarmed passengers. It might in other conditions have been necessary, but it would not be heroic. Similarly, there could be nothing heroic in Captain Smith or Murdoch putting an end to their lives. It is conceivable men might be so overwhelmed by the sense of disaster that they knew not how they were acting. But to be really heroic would have been to stop with the ship, as of course they did, with the hope of being picked up along with passengers and crew and returning to face an inquiry and to give evidence that would be of supreme value to the whole world for the prevention of similar disasters. It was not possible, but if heroism consists in doing the greatest good to the greatest number, it would have been heroic for both officers to expect to be saved. We do not know what they thought, but I, for one, like to imagine that they did so. Second officer Lightoller worked steadily at the boats until the last possible moment, went down with the ship, was saved in what seemed like a miraculous manner, and returned to give valuable evidence before the commissions of two countries. The second thing that stands out prominently in the emotions produced by the disaster is that in moments of urgent need, men and women turn for help to something entirely outside themselves. I remember reading some years ago a story of an atheist who was the guest at dinner of a regimental mess in India. The colonel listened to his remarks on atheism in silence and invited him for a drive the following morning. He took his guest up a rough mountain road in a light carriage drawn by two ponies and when some distance from the plain below, turned the carriage round and allowed the ponies to run away, as it seemed, downhill. In the terror of approaching disaster, the atheist was lifted out of his reasoned convictions and prayed aloud for help, when the colonel reined in his ponies, and with the remark that the whole drive had been planned with the intention of proving to his guest that there was a power outside his own reason descended quietly to level ground. The story may or may not be true, and in any case is not introduced as an attack on atheism, but it illustrates in a striking way the frailty of dependence on a man's own power and resource in imminent danger. To those men standing on the top deck with the boats all lowered, and still more so when the boats had all left, there came the realization that human resources were exhausted and human avenues of escape closed. With it came the appeal to whatever consciousness each had of a power that had created the universe. After all, some power had made the brilliant stars above, countless millions of miles away, moving in definite order, formed on a definite plan, and obeying a definite law had made each one of the passengers with ability to think and act. With the best proof, after all, of being created, the knowledge of their own existence, and now, if at any time, was the time to appeal to that power. When the boats had left, and it was seen the ship was going down rapidly, men stood in groups on the deck, engaged in prayer. And later, as some of them lay on the overturned collapsible boat, they repeated together over and over again the Lord's Prayer, irrespective of religious beliefs, some, perhaps, without religious beliefs, united in a common appeal for deliverance from their surroundings. And this was not because it was a habit, because they had learned this prayer at their mother's knee. Men do not do such things through habit. It must have been because each one saw removed the thousand and one ways in which he had relied on human, material things to help him, including even dependence on the overturned boat with its bubble of air inside, which any moment a rising swell might remove as it tilted the boat too far sideways and sink below the surface. Saul laid bare his utter dependence on something that had made him and given him power to think. Whether he named it God, or divine power, or first cause, or creator, or named it not at all, but recognized it unconsciously, saw these things, and expressed them in the form of words he was best acquainted with in common with his fellow man. 
he did so not through a sense of duty to his particular religion not because he had learned the words but because he recognized that it was the most practical thing to do the thing best fitted to help him men do practical things in times like that they would not waste a moment on mere words if those words were not an expression of the most intensely real conviction of which they were capable again like the feeling of heroism this appeal is innate and intuitive and it certainly has its foundation on a knowledge largely concealed no doubt of immortality i think this must be obvious there could be no other explanation of such a general sinking of all the emotions of the human mind expressed in a thousand different ways by a thousand different people in favor of this single appeal the behavior of people during the hours in the lifeboats the landing on the carpathia the life there and the landing in new york can all be summarized by saying that people did not act at all as they were expected to act or rather as most people expected they would act and in some cases have erroneously said they did act events were there to be faced and not to crush people down situations arose which demanded courage resource and in the cases of those who had lost friends most dear to them enormous self-control but very wonderfully they responded there was the same quiet demeanor and poise, the same inborn dominion over circumstances, the same conformity to a normal standard which characterized the crowd of passengers on the deck of the Titanic, and for the same reasons. The first two or three days ashore were undoubtedly rather trying to some of the survivors. It seemed as if coming into the world again, the four days shut off from any news seemed a long time and finding what a shock the disaster had produced the flags half mast the staring headlines the sense of gloom noticeable everywhere made things worse than they had been on the carpathia the difference in atmosphere was very marked and people gave way to some extent under it and felt the reaction gratitude for their deliverance and a desire to make the best of things must have helped soon however to restore them to normal conditions it is not at all surprising that some of the survivors felt quieter on the carpathia with its lack of news from the outside world if the following extract from a leading new york evening paper was some of the material of which the atmosphere on shore was composed Quote, stunned by the terrific impact the dazed passengers rushed from their staterooms into the main saloon amid the crash of splintering steel, rending of plates and shattering of girders, while the boom of falling pinnacles of ice upon the broken deck of the great vessel added to the horror. In a wild, ungovernable mob, they poured out of the saloons to witness one of the most appalling scenes possible to conceive. For a hundred feet, the bow was a shapeless mass of bent, broken, and splintered steel and iron. End quote. And so on. Horror piled on horror, and not a word of it true, or remotely approaching the truth. This paper was selling in the streets of New York, while the Carpathia was coming into dock, while relatives of those on board were at the docks to meet them, and anxiously buying any paper that might contain news. No one on the Carpathia could have supplied such information. There was no one else in the world at that moment who knew any details of the Titanic disaster, and the only possible conclusion is that the whole thing was a deliberate fabrication to sell the paper. There is a repetition of the same defect in human nature noticed in the provision of safety appliances on board ship, the lack of consideration for the other man. The remedy is the same the law it should be a criminal offense for any one to disseminate deliberate falsehoods that cause fear and grief the moral responsibility of the press is very great and its duty of supplying the public with only clean correct news is correspondingly heavy 
if the general public is not yet prepared to go so far as to stop the publication of such news by refusing to buy those papers that publish it then the law should be enlarged to include such cases libel is an offence and this is very much worse than any libel ever could be it is only right to add that the majority of the new york papers were careful only to report such news as had been obtained legitimately from survivors or from carpathia passengers it was sometimes exaggerated and sometimes not true at all but from the point of reporting what was heard most of it was quite correct one more thing must be referred to the prevalence of superstitious beliefs concerning the titanic i suppose no ship ever left port with so much miserable nonsense showered on her in the first place there is no doubt many people refused to sail on her because it was her maiden voyage and this apparently is a common superstition even the clerk of the white star office where i purchased my ticket admitted it was a reason that prevented people from sailing a number of people have written to the press to say they had thought of sailing on her or had decided to sail on her but because of omens cancelled the passage many referred to the sister ship the olympic pointed to the ill luck they say that has dogged her her collision with the hawk and a second mishap necessitating repairs and a wait in the harbor where passengers deserted her they prophesied even greater disaster for the titanic saying they would not dream of traveling on the boat even some aboard were very nervous in an undefined way one lady said she had never wished to take this boat but her friends had insisted and bought her a ticket and she had not a happy moment since a friend told me of the voyage of the olympic from southampton after the wait in harbor and said there was a sense of gloom pervading the whole ship the stewards and stewardesses even going so far as to say it was a death ship this crew by the way was largely transferred to the titanic the incident with the new york at southampton the appearance of the stoker at queenstown in the funnel combine with all this to make a mass of nonsense in which apparently sensible people believe or which at any rate they discuss correspondence is published with an official of the white star line from someone imploring them not to name the new ship gigantic because it seems like tempting fate when the titanic has been sunk it would seem almost as if we were back in the middle ages when witches were burned because they kept black cats there seems no more reason why a black stoker should be an ill omen for the titanic than a black cat should be for an old woman the only reason for referring to these foolish details is that a surprisingly large number of people think there may be something in it the effect is this that if a ship's company and a number of passengers get imbued with that undefined dread of the unknown the relics no doubt of the savage's fear of what he does not understand it has an unpleasant effect on the harmonious working of the ship the officers and crew feel the depressing influence and it may even spread so far as to prevent them being as alert and keen as they otherwise would may even result in some duty not being as well done as usual just as the unconscious demand for speed and haste to get across the atlantic may have tempted captains to take a risk they might otherwise not have done so these gloomy forebodings may have more effect sometimes than we imagine only a little thing is required sometimes to weigh down the balance for and against a certain course of action at the end of this chapter of mental impressions it must be recorded that one impression remains constant with us all today that of the deepest gratitude that we came safely through the wreck of the titanic and its corollary that our legacy from the wreck our debt to those who were lost with her is to see as far as in us lies that such things are impossible ever again meanwhile we can say of them as shelley himself the victim of a similar disaster says of his friend keats in adonai peace peace he is not dead he doth not sleep 
He hath awakened from the dream of life. He lives, he wakes. Tis death is dead, not he. Mourn not for Adonai. The End End of Chapter 9 And End of the Loss of the SS Titanic